This man is the internet's favorite Sigma male businessman, but he's secretly a bad dude. Time to idolize him. But seriously, this story goes hard. We open up in a fancy pants restaurant where wealthy people eat little portions of, uh, whatever that is. Oh, that one's a duck. Cool. This couple orders a swordfish meatloaf before we cut to our titular characters. They hate the place, calling it a chick's restaurant. That's racist. They proceed to engage in a little questionable locker room talk about their co-worker, Paul Allen, who's coincidentally sitting over there. Remember that name, by the way. As their dinner concludes, they remark, not bad, after the bill comes up to $570. That's at least a million dollars in today's money, accounting for inflation, of course. They all place their metal credit cards down, which make a distinctive clickety-clack sound. Goals. Later, the boys skip all the brokies in line and head into a club. As the fellas groove, Bateman, played by Batman, goes to pay for angry juice. He tries to pay with some voucher thing, but apparently the place isn't accepting that anymore, so he hands over some cash. As the bartender turns around, Patrick Bateman screams some vile rhetoric at her, even describing in detail how he'd clap her, and not in the fun way. But somehow, she didn't seem to hear him at all. He flips his charisma back on and even leaves her with a sly wink. Now, cut to Sigma male time. We're in Patrick's apartment. Classical music is playing. He's in his undies. He stares deeply at his own reflection while sucking in his cheeks, puckering his lips, and taking a morning wee-wee. Based. He proceeds to walk us through his beauty routine. He's very beautiful. While removing his face mask thing, he also explains that he also wears a mask metaphorically, and that though people might sense he's a real, genuine person, deep down, there's no one really there. I don't know what that means, but it's sure to leave a mark on impressionable teenagers 20 years from now. After, Patrick Sigma struts his way into the office. He has his secretary, Jean, make some dinner reservations. Before she departs, he coldly tells her not to wear that outfit again. Looks like she failed the drip check. As a man of culture, Bateman expects her to wear a dress and high heels. Based. Later, Patrick and his fiancée, Evelyn, are taking a cab ride to the restaurant. Patrick is trying to tune into The Baby's latest album, but Evelyn keeps buzzing in his ear. Suddenly, she starts yapping about wanting a wedding soon. A look of disdain paints over Patrick's face as he declines. He simply doesn't have the time. But that's BS, as Evelyn notes, his father practically owns the company. She also notes that he doesn't even like the job, which leaves me wondering, why doesn't he just quit? Thankfully, Patrick is quick to explain that he just wants to fit in. He then proceeds to flex his jaw muscles on us before we cut. At the restaurant, the couple rendezvous with, uh, some emo kids and a dirtbag named Timothy from work. Whoa, this guy's being a bit too zesty with Bateman's bride-to-be. Patrick notes that they're likely doing a lot more of that behind the scenes, but he doesn't care. Sigma rule number 357, let your girl clap other guys. But here's the thing, Patrick's got his own clapping going on with Courtney, who's together with his dork, Lewis. He's what we call in the business, beta male. Pathetic. Everyone starts to make small talk about the social issues of the times, and Bateman starts a sympathetic spiel about ending world hunger, stopping racism, and canceling poorly CGI'd Marvel movies. Now that I can get behind. Timothy responds with a snarky laugh while Lewis praises Patrick's heartfelt and sincere message. Patrick proceeds to look off with a heartless and insincere glare. After, Patrick walks up on this chick and just says hi. And that's all it takes for her to start looking him up and down. Ha, <laughs> girl trouble? Just walk up to her and say hi. And be Christian Bale. Ha <laughs> ha. Suddenly, we cut to Patrick arguing at the dry cleaners. Apparently, he spilled some wine on his bedsheets. Though, I have a feeling it's actually bl uh, spaghetti juice. Unfortunately for Patrick, the lady doesn't speak English. Being chilling moment. Then, just as his anger reaches a fever's pitch, a friend pops by. But Patrick is in a hurry. He has to go be handsome somewhere else. Not relatable. That night, he takes Corny out to dinner and picks out exactly what she'll be eating. And they say chivalry is dead. Then, she goes to sleep. Weird. But actually, she's addicted to substances. I'd say don't do that stuff, kids. But then again, I'm pretty sure TikTok is even more addictive and toxic. Society. Now, off his time. Lewis admires Patrick's dapper drip, but gets a little too close for comfort. Then, the infamous Paul Allen shows up, casually passing his business card before dipping. Yes, at last we're here. Prepare for the card scene. This prompts Patrick to proudly whip out his own, much to the curiosity of his peers. They're quite impressed at first. Before Patrick can finish rattling off the specs of his card, his baby is usurped. Patrick is stunned as Timothy praises Van Patten's card. 
How'd a nitwit like you get so tasteful? He says. Meanwhile, Patrick is seething. His fist is balled up near his mouth and his lips are pursed, ready to explode. But it doesn't stop there. Timothy whips out his card, and it's even more immaculate. Impressive. Very nice. Let's see Paul Allen's card. Be careful what you wish for, Bateman. Timothy flashes the card as the camera craftfully zooms in. Look at that subtle off-white coloring. The tasteful thickness of it. Are we still talking about cards? Oh my god. It even has a watermark. Patrick's thousand-card stare intensifies. His fingers tremble and the card drops. That was one of the scenes of all time ever recorded. That night, Patrick stumbles upon a homeless man and gives him some words of encouragement. He shouts, telling him to get a job. Mans is out here promoting the Sigma male grind set to those that need it most. Yeah, and then he claps him, probably to take out his frustrations over the card crisis. That's one way to stop homelessness. Society. After, he does more beauty stuff while continuing to narrate about how he's not really a human being, and his only emotions are greed and disgust. He's literally me. Why do you think I make these videos? Anyway, Patrick is at a party rocking a perturbed look. Is that Paul Allen? Getting zesty with his girl? I mean, his other girl? Courtney? Also, he learns that Paul is still handling the Fisher account. This man is taking everything he's worked for. So, Patrick goes up to invite him to dinner. Naturally, Paul still thinks Patrick is that other guy, Marcus. In fact, I forgot to mention that. But yeah, he thinks Patrick is such a nobody that he confuses him with another nobody. Cut to dinner, and Patrick cuts to the chase, inquiring as to how Paul got the Fisher account. Well, I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you, he replies. This is ironic, because, well, Patrick is the one who claps. Fast forward a bit, and Paul is zooted off the angry Jews. He starts to talk smack about Evelyn and her loser man, aka Patrick Bateman. Little does he know, he's sitting right next to the guy. Marcus, I mean Patrick, lets his face do the talking. Iconic. The date progresses back to Patrick's place where Paul is sitting by some newspapers laid out just under him. Strange. Hmm. And now Patrick is putting on a raincoat. And what's this? Huey Lewis in the news. What a bop. He proceeds to enthusiastically sing the band's praises before picking up an axe and clapping Paul Allen. He dies due to death. English 100. Now let's not forget the cigar. And the body. Gotta casually carry that out, all whilst maintaining the most pristine Sigma male face. Then he breaks into Paul's place as panic overcomes him, because he just realized Paul's apartment has a pristine view of the park and is clearly more expensive than his. Actual lines from the movie, by the way. Yeah, that's why he's panicked. He packs some luggage, leaves a phony voicemail, and just like that, Paul is off to Paris, supposedly, but not so fast. Soon after, a detective comes by asking, my god, is that Willem Dafoe, aka Green Goblin? Anyway, Patrick is clearly nervous, and something tells me the detective notices. The plot thickens. We cut to the sounds of harrowing screams. Oh, it's just Patrick listening to the sounds of horror movies to fuel his workouts. Kinda based. By the way, don't work out like this. Much too fast. You see, it's imperative you get a nice, deep stretch in the muscle for optimal gains. You're welcome. That night, Patrick picks up a gal. Actually, make that too. Things are quite awkward as he once again narrates about music while setting up a camera. Hmm, wonder what that's for. Then, he delivers a timeless line to one of the gals. Don't just stare at it, eat it. Of course, referring to the delicious entree of snacks he totally prepared for them, right? <laughs> then, we cut to the boys talking about girls. There are no girls with good personalities. <laughs> Whoa, that's racist. Patrick brings up a quote from Ed Gein. First, the boys think that's some cool alpha business guy. But Patrick clarifies, Ed Gein, serial clapper from the 50s. He said when he sees a pretty girl, one part of him wants to take her out on a date. The boys wait with bated breath, ready to burst out laughing at what the other part of him wants. To see her head on a stick. Patrick adds with a laugh. Strangely, the others don't find that part relatable. Fortunately, Lewis appears, diffusing the tension, but not for long. As he pulls out a brand new business card, the metal holder makes a satisfying slick sound that echoes across the room. The boys like it. Then Lewis pans the card over to Patrick. The camera zooms in. Oh my god. Not this again. Rage immediately consumes Patrick. He storms off in pursuit of Lewis, following him to the bathroom. Approaching from behind like a predator stalking its prey, Patrick wraps his hands around Lewis's neck. Lewis turns around and gives us his hand. I've seen the way you look at me, Patrick. God, I've been waiting so long. Why here? He says. Patrick's face quivers. He wants to clap him, but not like this. He quickly washes his gloves, then says, I have to return some videotapes, before storming off. Lewis is like, call me. Back at the office, the detective returns for more detectiving. That's a word. Not much comes of it aside from the fact we learn he also likes Huey Lewis. But now suddenly it's not Patrick's type of music. What a deep and complex character. Later at the club, Patrick and Timothy eat salt through their nose. So weird. As per usual, he walks up to a girl, says hi, and then they're off to the races. The next day, Patrick is in his office twirling a piece of what is presumed 
presumably her hair. He's doing a crossword puzzle but is just filling in the words meat and bone. Then he spontaneously invites his secretary, Jean, to dinner. He asks her where she wants to go. Dorcia, excellent choice. He dials them up and makes a reservation, but the guy says they're booked, but Patrick pretends they're not and excitedly finalizes the date on the phone. That's the attitude. First, they meet up at his apartment, where Patrick reaches for some, don't mind the head, ice cream. Talk about brain freeze, <laughs> and my life. He hands the cool treat over and she offers him a bite, but he's on a diet. For what? You look great, she says. You can always be thinner, look better, he retorts, based. He starts to ask her about life and her future while reaching for odd instruments like duct tape and then a nail gun, which he casually sneaks behind her head. As he's about to pull the trigger, though, a voice message comes in. It's Evelyn. Awkward. Things are tense and Jean asks if he wants her to leave. In a rare, genuine moment of honesty, Patrick tells her if she stays, something bad is likely to happen. Of course, his definition of bad is much worse than hers. We cut to a dinner with the detective as they catch up on the case. Patrick still has no alibi for the night Paul was clapped. Well, actually, he does once again hit us with the I was returning some videotapes line. Truly one of the lines in this whole movie. Also, pay close attention to the way he salts his food. I just I just thought it was funny. The conversation is tense, and Patrick is wearing his guilt like a mask. It'd sure be ridiculous to think one of his friends killed him. Isn't that right, Patrick? Says the detective. Patrick's face briefly morphs into a smile before returning to a deadpan expression, as if to say, Ha <laughs> yeah, unless... Anyway, at night, he picks up that same girl again. Well, actually, after the last time, she's gonna need a bit more moolah. Fortunately, Patrick happily obliges. I think we know the formula by now. We got two girls, awkward conversation material, some random spiel about music, and of course, for the next part, you'll need to use your imagination. But immediately after that, this girl starts running, only to be chased by Patrick wielding a weed whacker. She makes her way down the hallway, banging on the doors before reaching the stairs. Patrick catches up, but she's already too far gone. So naturally, he 360 no scopes the chainsaw down the stairs and actually hits her. Calculated. Triumphant. He lets out a Sigma shout. Inspiring. Sometime later, Patrick is at dinner with Evelyn. His behavior's erratic and he just tells her, it's over. She doesn't quite believe him at first, but soon it becomes clear. She begins to cry and everyone is looking. Patrick quickly switches to nice guy mode in an attempt to keep up his precious appearance. Though, he soon leaves citing some, you guessed it, videotapes that he has to return. Understandable. But in truth, he heads to an ATM before spotting a little kitty. Suddenly, the ATM demands he feed it a stray cat. Understandable. As anyone else would, Patrick picks up the cat and prepares to clap, but then this lady spots him, so he hits her with an easy snipe. Uh-oh, the cop saw him. He starts running, but then decides to fight back. We GTA now. After a couple shots, the cop car spontaneously explode. Patrick is in awe of his power, or perhaps confused about what the heck is going on. When did he get a gun anyway? Who knew he kept that thang on him? Patrick runs to his apartment, but oh no, the man at the front tells him he has to sign in. Sign this. He continues his way out the revolving door, but then a janitor appears, so he turns 360 degrees and claps him. This is a statement about working class America. Now, he's in another apartment lobby. He goes to whip out his Yaminer, but this time, it's a pen. Expectation subverted. He makes it into his apartment and spots helicopter lights outside. Five star wanted level achieved. Then he drops down into cover and calls his lawyer, confessing to his crimes. His account of them is messy to say the least. He doesn't even know exactly how many bodies he's got. Same. The next day, he heads to Paul Allen's place to check on what's left of him, but he only finds painting supplies. And an old woman. Sounds like a good time to me. But it quickly becomes clear that he's not. Patrick is shook. The woman calmly asks him to go now and not to make any trouble. Fortunately, he leaves. Then, he runs outside and calls Jean. He's having a full-on mental breakdown as she tells him about a meeting. He says he can't go and hangs up. Meanwhile, Jean finds his calendar and begins to go through all the disturbing drawings in it. Later, Patrick seems to compose himself and heads on over to lunch. He chats with the boys before spotting his lawyer, the one he called, spilling his confession. He walks up to him but quickly finds that his lawyer, Harry, figured it was all just a joke. But Patrick is very serious. Harry, though, points out one flaw in his joke. Bateman is too much of a dork to do anything like that. But wait, he's Bateman, or is he? Harry calls him Davis. Things escalate, and Patrick gets a bit touchy. Harry is serious now, too, and sternly tells him that what he's claiming is not possible. Why isn't it possible? It's just not. Why not, you stupid bastard? Patrick says, because Harry had lunch with Paul Allen twice in Paris this week. Patrick's world is crumbling around him. He heads back to his boys, who in fact do refer to him as Bateman. And cutting back to Jean, we see her still going through that sussy calendar. Moral of the story? My pain is constant and sharp, and I do not hope for a better world for anyone. In fact, I want my pain to be inflicted on others. I want no one to escape. Ha 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 ha.